Welcome everyone and thanks for joining us today. Uh, we're going to go through some best practices around architecting security for Microsoft Azure and uh, the VMs within Azure. So we're going to go through that content today. Um, with me, uh, I've got uh, Paul Lepage, who's our solutions engineer at Alert Logic. My name is Oliver Pinson Roxborough. I'm the EMEA director for Alert Logic, and we're going to be covering off uh, some really interesting topics today around architecting uh, security in Azure. So. Um, before we get started, though, let's start with, that, the, with the, uh, housekeeping items. Uh, first and foremost, all of the audio comes through your uh, computer, so it would come through the streaming uh, uh, machine that you're using today. So make sure you've got your sound turned right up so you can hear us uh, nice and clearly. Uh, we also have um, a questions box over on the right-hand side so you can uh, provide us with some questions. Uh, we'll answer those towards the end. So if you do have any, just feel free to submit those throughout the presentation uh, and we'll cover those off towards the end of the presentation. We should have uh, plenty of time for questions, so we'll certainly cover those off where we can. Uh, the webinar will be recorded as well and published through our Bright Talk channel. So um, if you need to come back and revisit any of the content that we're going to present today, you can certainly go back and do that through Bright Talk. Uh, if you have any technical problems, um, unfortunately, we won't be able to help you. We're going to be focusing on the content, so if you need any help, just uh, click the help button. It's all provided in the screens uh, that you have in front of you, so you can certainly go through and uh, get uh, help as needed. Okay, so without any further ado, uh, let's start with a threat landscape. Um, so I'm going to start out by just explaining a bit about um, kind of attack vectors, how attackers are targeting cloud platforms. Um, we're going to talk about really the concepts of, of the attackers and how they're attacking organizations to give you a better understanding of how you can start to think about implementing controls and, and why you would want to implement controls, especially in your Azure platform. And as you move and adopt the cloud, a new cloud platform, what do you need to be looking for? So in order to understand all that, um, what we first need to understand is the motivations of our attackers or certainly understand how our attackers operate. Um, Impacts of breaches are, are, are huge. You see, of course, in the press um, on a regular basis, there's somebody being hacked, and it's far-reaching and long-lived. The average is around 205 days before an attacker gets detected. So what we need to be able to do is understand how that attacker is going to operate. Um, so how we uh, look at it at Alert Logic is we use a common um, framework, which is uh, the cyber kill chain. If you haven't come across it before, it's worth going and have a look into. Uh, the concept is that this is the typical approach an attacker would take in order to compromise a system. And of course, different attackers have very different motivations, ranging from financial um, gain, so they'll be trying to steal information that they can, uh, of course, then uh, sell on to others, uh, credit card information, social security numbers, sensitive data in general. Um, they'll also be, in some cases, motivated to try and take down systems, more like a hacktivist activity. And of course, in some cases, certain organizations may even be targeted by nation state. The impact is, is typically either financial loss, harm, brand reputation, of course, um, and of course, uh, scrutiny from regulators if somebody finds out you've been breached. So in order to understand that attacker, uh, the first thing we want to make sure is we have controls in place that we can identify when they're poking around our systems to have a look to see if there's any weaknesses they might be able to exploit. So that's our kind of early signs of attack. There's a lot of that going on typically. People are always poking around people's websites and applications. So we can't always rely on that. And uh, that first piece of evidence leading to us making any sort of judgment on how we we, we identify further into that attack or look at that attack. We, it may not be attack at all. It may be just be the early signs of an attack. Um, so we don't. All, it's not always the case where organizations need to immediately go and jump on somebody doing some poking around. But once it starts to get into the, into the area of they're, they're starting to perform an initial attack, so we've found them, we've seen they're doing some recon, we now see them escalating their attack and they're starting to perform initial attack based on the information they've, they've captured. The next step would be they're trying to consume um, additional information or capture additional information, pull down additional tools, send information out of the network, um, and they'll, they'll essentially uh, create a command and control. So back to a server that they can then have, retain access with and provide themselves with additional tools and ways to, to additionally attack the infrastructure if required. In some cases, the attackers will skip phases, but if the attacker doesn't have the necessary information he's looking for, let's say he's attacked a, uh, a server that's a web application, doesn't have any sensitive data in there, the next thing they'll try to do is discover additional systems compromise. And once they've done that, then they'll, they'll then exfiltrate data. They'll extract as much information as possible. 
Now, there's some interesting com uh, comments here from uh, the CTO at Microsoft uh, Azure. Uh, and what he's saying here is even companies focused on security are getting hacked. Uh, obviously, a lot of people have some level of security in their organization. It doesn't necessarily mean they're focused. They just decide that, of course, we need some level of control, so we'll buy some products. But it's interesting to see that there's a, a statement there made by uh, the, the Azure CTO about that. And then the second thing, of course, here that he's mentioned, which is really interesting, is uh, the, uh, the business of cloud is providing a secure, reliable, scalable infrastructure. Without that, there is no cloud business. And it's a really important point here, uh, is that a lot of people are now moving to adopt new cloud platforms because what they're trying to do is to uh, benefit from having not only um, somebody else managing the infrastructure for them or parts of the infrastructure for them are doing all the heavy lifting for them, they also are going to cloud platforms in order to get a more secure service because they feel that they don't have the experience to be able to maintain these systems uh, themselves and to uh, continue the level of security that, say, a Microsoft would provide for them or a, another cloud, big cloud provider. So now we know a little bit about how the attackers work. They're typically looking at attacking the in the cloud space. Uh, certainly, number one attack vector is, is the application stack. So most people, when they start to move into the cloud um, space, what they will do is they'll start by moving uh, web, web products uh, to start with. They, they tend to be easier to migrate. Um, there's a, a fairly uh, strong platform already designed to be able to support uh, web-based applications. So the, the first thing they'll do is they'll move applications. But ultimately, you have to expose, or in a lot of cases, your applications are exposed to the internet because you want to provide a service to somebody, give them the ability to use your products. Um, and so you'll expose an application of some flavor. If it's not a, a full-on, full-fat um, web application, it may be a web service. So the attackers are, are wise to that. So the number one attack vector we see is that the attackers will be attacking the, the web application. But it doesn't just happen at one stage of the application stack. There's only one, it's not just one part of the application stack they're, stack they're typically targeting. It's multiple bits of the application stack all the way from the network, all the way down through the systems into the application stack, and then ultimately the database to consume the sensitive data that re resides in the database. And then if we look at that kind of kill chain strategy again, we can start to see how how the attackers are essentially, I guess, you know, using different parts of the application stack to consume different pieces of information. So doing initial kind of recon, and um, doing some level of brute forcing, then of course doing some, potentially doing some SQL injection in the database to consume additional data or get the database to do something it shouldn't, create user accounts, maybe even if the, if the initial uh, deployment of the app, uh, database hasn't been secured, and then ultimately the exfiltration of data. So all the way through the application stack, there's, there's something the application, the, the, uh, um, the attacker is trying to leverage in order to gain access to the information or, of course, to install tools that they can then use that machine, that application, to then do other things for as part of a wider attack, potentially. Um, so one of the things, of course, here also to note is that security must be cloud native. Uh, and we're going to cover off a couple of those things as we go through the presentation. We're going to talk about having cloud native solutions in order to enable uh, security in the cloud and uh, cover off some of those points throughout the presentation. So if we go into a bit more detail about what the application, uh, what the attackers are actually doing and how they're attacking different types of systems, if we look at traditional on-prem attacks, what the attackers will mostly be looking for is something that they can brute force, or the majority of the attack vectors that we see is somebody trying to brute force uh, a login to a remote access server, uh, logins to a, a web application potentially, um, performing some form of reconnectivity in addition to that. But largely speaking, you'll see a lot of uh, uh, brute force attacks being attempted against on-prem solutions in our data set. Uh, second only to, uh, to that is uh, application attacks on on-prem. So first and foremost, certainly seems like an easy route if you want to try and guess passwords, brute force passwords. Next step would be likely to see them try and attack the application stack. And then if you look at cloud, it's much, it's kind of similar in the types of attacks that you're seeing, but it's more heavily weighted to the application stack and attacking the application stack. Now, if you think about it, it kind of makes sense because on the on-prem world, there's quite a few people that probably need access to be able to um, kind of monitor, maintain, configure, secure those applications for you remotely. So you'll have more likely, um, more likely you'll have lots of different tools to give you remote access. RDP, SSH, maybe even some remote um, uh, monitoring tools that, that you can access directly or into your on-prem 
in environments. On the cloud side, you typically do a lot of that through the cloud providers um, UI, their portal or their APIs. So you're less likely to have a, a wider attack surface area where you've got lots of access to lots of different um, remote access tools and systems. Uh, not saying that that doesn't happen. There isn't. There is definitely the case where people have jump hosts into their environments, but largely speaking, we're more likely to see the attacker target the application in the cloud infrastructure. Okay, so why is cloud difficult? Why is it different to how we would normally protect uh, an on-prem solution, our traditional models of providing servers to our client base? Well, really, it's because it's ever-evolving. The, the cloud space is not standing still. It's a, it's a new industry. They're, they're trying to evolve their abilities, their capabilities, so it's ever-evolving. New features are coming out all the time, um, and we've got to keep on top of that. The other thing, of course, is that we can scale much faster in the cloud. You can add new servers as quickly as you like. You don't have to go and purchase an appliance to put an appliance in your rack. You don't have to buy servers to go and put servers in your rack. Um, it's all there ready, ready and waiting for you to choose that you want to add a new server. Managing figure, configurations is harder over whichever platform you look at, whether it's a, a laptop all the way through to a server. But in the cloud space, of course, you've got lots of other configuration options. Um, we always want more features, but of course, the more features we get, the more complex it gets because we have to learn about how those features work and how they operate. And getting a healthy balance of great features versus um, limiting the complexity is very tough. Um, so we have to, it's becoming harder to manage those configurations. And of course, if you're thinking about hybrid cloud options or adopting lots of cloud platforms, you've got to think about how do you configure, how do you manage configurations across all these platforms. And then, of course, understanding what is deployed and what images are being used is, for, is, is very tough. And Paul's going to talk a lot more about that in, in the presentation in a moment. But ultimately, if somebody can just easily deploy a, a server, it, it, they tend to question less what they are putting on that server, how they're building that server out, because they can just blow it away and start again when they need to. So it doesn't really matter. Whereas previously, if you had to buy a new server, you have to do a lot of testing and uh, regression testing and all that kind of stuff before you get to a state where you can actually buy the hardware. So it's a kind of different mindset, different strategy. Um, and remediation in, uh, needs to address the root cause rather than the symptom. The, what we're saying here is that in a traditional deployment of a cloud infrastructure, you would um, you don't really worry too much about the servers. We're in, a, in the in an old school way of putting it into a server rack. You'd you'd really look after and nurture that server. You'd make sure that it's it's, it's healthy. You, you keep on top of whether it's overutilized. You, you kind of worry about all those things. When you get into the cloud, you don't worry about that anymore. You know, if a machine is, is sick and not working very well, it doesn't operate how you expect it to, you can in theory shoot it in the head and start again with a brand new one when you need to. Um, and the last part, of course, is misconceptions around securing the cloud. There's a lot of misconceptions about, yes, it's definitely more secure. It can be just as secure, let's say, to go to the cloud, but only if you do it right. And there's still a lot of things you need to consider. Uh, it's not just that because somebody else is responsible for um, a half of, of the stuff that you need to get, get done in there, it doesn't mean that it's going to completely remove you from the need of need to secure those systems. So there's a misconception that people think that everything's secure and I just move there and it's all good for me. That's definitely not the case. And we're going to explain some of that stuff right now. So with that, uh, that's a quick intro into what we're going to be talking about today. I'm going to hand it over to Paul and he's going to cover off the next section of this presentation. Thanks, Paul. Thank you, Ollie. So let's take a look at what your, sec your security responsibilities are in the cloud. And the first step to this really is understanding the shared responsibility model and pretty much all the cloud providers will will talk about this. Um, so unlike in an on-prem environment where you control pretty much everything from the data center all the way up, of course when you move to the cloud you've suddenly got the cloud provider taking care of uh, quite a, a lot of that stuff for you but at the same time not all of it. So it's quite important to be aware of exactly what the cloud provider is doing on your behalf and then what's left for you as the customer. Uh, to look after from a security perspective. So in the case of Microsoft, they're of course running a whole load of data centers around the world and as you would probably expect, they're, they're very good at doing that and the data centers themselves are very secure. And you know, one of the, that, that's sort of part of the reason why you know, they will never take you on a data center tour, for example. They, they don't want to let anyone other than trusted and vetted staff in there, but also on just the nature of a, a cloud platform itself. Even if you were to go into a data center, there's probably nothing of interest to see in there, just racks and racks of servers. It wouldn't even be 
um, obvious, you know, which servers were doing what or, or what the role of each one was. Um, so we trust Microsoft pretty much completely to take care of the physical uh, infrastructure for us. Um, on top of that, they're also, of course, looking after the, the physical network. So they're looking after uplinks to the internet. Uh, they're looking after the physical elements of uh, maintaining network connectivity. And they're also providing you with network virtualization so that you can then go and you know, build your own uh, virtual networks and configure your own subnets so that you can run your virtual machines on them. So while Microsoft will do some ele ele uh, sorry, elements of security here, such as you know, the segmentation of, of logical networks, so making sure that one customer's VNet can't talk to another customer's VNet, or even a, another VNet belonging to, to the same customer. Um, they're also, of course, looking after uh, the, the physical perimeter of the network, and they're providing you know, some degree of distributed denial of service protection. Of course, it's, it's in their interest to do that. Um, because they want to make sure that you know if a large volumetric attack comes in affecting or targeting a single IP address that it doesn't affect multiple customers on their platform. So there is a degree of uh, DDoS protection built into the platform itself. However, the virtual networks that you build out for yourself and the subnets and things that you create and the, the traffic between your virtual machines is, is uh, not really looked at at all by Microsoft. Uh, so you as the customer are then left to look after your own network threat detection, so implement your own uh, intrusion detection solutions. Uh, you're also, of course, responsible for configuring the, the network security elements of your configuration, so making sure that the appropriate rules are in place on your network security groups. And if you're um, needing to encrypt any of your network traffic, it's, of course, your responsibility to do that as well. If we move up the stack a little bit and start to look at virtual machines, of course, Microsoft are taking care of all of the hypervisor management for you. So they run um, a, a customized version of, of essentially Hyper-V underneath the scenes. It was, was called Red Dog at one point, I believe. Um, and they have some other elements there, so things like the fabric controller that you know, takes care of what sort of gets deployed around the data center and separation of customers. Uh, so they are, of course, responsible for managing all of those elements. And th they have some quite you know, significant measures in place to ensure the security of, of these elements of the platform. Um, so if you listen to uh, anyone like Mark Rosinovich talk about the sorts of things that they do there, um, they quite regularly run uh, what's known as red teaming and blue team exercises. Uh, so they essentially have a, a blue team that's, that's basically the internal security team whose job it is is to look for and anticipate what people might attempt to do against the platform itself in, in terms of trying to compromise it. Um, and then from time to time, they'll assemble a, a red team and have a think about you know, how they might actually be able to compromise their own security. And they'll then go off and get these, this red team to launch an attack against the platform and see how far they get. Um, obviously, hoping that the blue team will pick up what they're doing and um, and be able to prevent them from actually doing anything malicious. And so these things take place on a regular basis and they, they learn a lot of lessons from those. So we can be quite comfortable that all the things that Microsoft are doing are really as secure as they can be. Um, but of course, from a virtual machine perspective, once you've spun up your virtual machine, um, Microsoft are really no longer interested in what's happening inside it. So as soon as you've deployed it, you're then responsible for making sure that it's um, configuration is correct in terms of the operating system configuration. You, of course, need to manage user access to that virtual machine. Um, you'll need to patch it on, on, on an ongoing basis as well. And you'll need to do things like make sure that it's writing the appropriate log messages, that, that you're collecting those and looking at those, um, and that you're scanning the virtual machines regularly for vulnerabilities. And then finally, at the application layer at, at the very top here, really Microsoft aren't interested at all in what you're doing from an application perspective, um, assuming for the moment that you're running infrastructure as a service rather than platform as a service. Um, so really, there's nothing to stop you from bringing the most insecure web application you can possibly think of and sticking it on the Azure platform. Microsoft will have no visibility into the fact that you've done that. Um, so really, all elements of application security belong to you as the customer, so you're responsible for you know, ideally implementing a web application firewall, making sure that you have you know, secure coding practices and you're not leaving yourselves exposed to things like SQL injection. Um, 
making sure that you're patching the applications, um, managing the configurations of them, and managing access to those applications. So really everything at the application layer, you know, we as customers on top of the platform are responsible for handling. Uh, now, so you'll see in the diagram here, there are some of the boxes have been colored white with an, an orange circle around them. And those are the elements that uh, you as a customer are responsible for securing and that Alert Logic can help you with. Um, final point on here in the, the very bottom right hand corner, you know, at the infrastructure level, uh, you as the customer are responsible for configuration best practices. So while Microsoft provides uh, physical security, when you start to define uh, your environment through, through software, through the configuration of the platform, uh, you're responsible really for making sure that you configure that according to best practices so that you know, you're um, not leaving yourselves open to an attack against the control plane of the platform itself. And we're going to look through the next few slides into um, some ways that you can ensure that you are configuring this correctly. Before we move into that though, just uh, firstly have a think about um, you know, the security tools that you might want to deploy into Azure in order to help you with security. Um, so in addition to what Alert Logic can provide you, you know, the Microsoft provides you with the Azure Security Center. Um, it's definitely a, a very good first step um, from what we've seen of it. You know, it will go and look at uh, some of those elements we were just discussing, so how you've configured the platform itself. And it will start providing you with some recommendations about uh, things that you might want to do in order to resolve um, anything that, that needs to be resolved there. And in, in, in traditional Microsoft manner, it will, of course, also go in and offer to resolve those for you in a number of instances. So the, the standard Microsoft user experience that we're, that we're used to of, you know, would you like me to do this for you, is present in the Azure Security Center. Um, of course, anything to do with security is, is not a one-time activity. So if you do deploy Azure Security Center, you will need to go and continuously monitor that for changes and for recommendations because it will be popping those up on a regular basis. Um, and really with any security tools that we deploy, you know, they, the tools themselves can be complicated to use and, and difficult to deploy and expensive to manage and tune. And the, the reason for that is that they really need you know, experienced um, security analysts and security researchers to drive them and to create content for them. Um, because of course, if you don't have those people in place, um, if you're not updating content very quickly, of course that can get stale as new vulnerabilities are released. Um, and a lot of these things are, are very, very um, you know, sort of niche products and they, they require some quite specific knowledge to, to use them and to implement them. So Microsoft have tried to make that easy for you with Azure Security Center and Alert Logic um, can also make that easy for you with the products and services that we provide, which we'll talk about uh, towards the end of the presentation. So we'll have a look here at um, securing the Azure environment itself. Um, so we often talk about applications as a stack and as with um, buildings, if you're building a building, uh, you need a stable foundation and the same is true for application stacks. Um, if we don't have a, a, a secure foundation, uh, you know, these things can fall over and if they fall over, bad things can happen. So we want to make sure that the foundations that we're building on in Azure are solid and that they follow best practices. Um, so really the first thing that you want to look at here is to secure the administrator account. And that's the account that you've used to sign up for Azure. Um, and it basically has full and, and unfettered access to pretty much everything to do with, with Azure. So you can create and remove subscriptions, it can alter billing, and it can delegate access to other people um, and to subscriptions. Um, so because it has so much power, I, ideally you don't really want to be using that on a regular basis, um, maybe except for in a, in a break glass type situation, just because of the, the amount of things that it could do. Um, and if it's compromised, it of course could do all sorts of damage. Somebody can come and just delete all of your Azure resources. Um, so if you are using that account, ideally you probably want to stop using it. Um, if you're not sure if it's being used, you really want to find out if that, if that is the case. Um, and to do that, the easiest way probably is to re review your audit logs. Um, Azure audit logging is turned on by default. So 
If anyone is using it, the evidence should be there in the audit logs. And if you do find that someone's using it, we just need to find out who they are and ideally create them their own account and role so that they use that instead of the, the built-in administrator account. Uh, when you're setting that account up, it's quite a good idea to use a distribution list as the email address for it rather than the email address for an individual just to get around some issues relating to employee turnover. So using a distribution list with sort of key stakeholders in it is, is quite a good way to you know, get around the fact that you know, Bob signed up for this account and he's now left the organization and we, and we can't get into it. Um, because it has so much power, we definitely want to enable multi-factor authentication for this account. So if you're using Azure MFA server, uh, you can make it more difficult to use the account by using a hardware token um, that is supported if, you're, if you happen to be using Azure MFA server. Um, so if you can use a hardware token, that's definitely a, go a, a good idea. Um, you can put the token into a safe or you can leave it with a trusted person and you can define an auditable process for retrieving that key and getting access to that key. Um, so if you have all that in place, you'll know exactly when that account was used, um, exactly why it was used, and y you can prevent people from using it just because it's easier to do that. If you're not using Azure MFA server, um, you still can use MFA for this account, um, but you just can't use a hardware token. Um, so definitely enable MFA, um, and the options you have are to use, uh, you may, might want to use an office phone number, um, and they have the number belonging to a trusted person, so at least somebody has to be in the office to be able to use the account. Uh, or you could get a, a dedicated SIM card for this and treat the SIM card as a hardware token and, and store that away somewhere nice and safe. Uh, by default, that account administrator also has service administrator access for each subscription that you create. Um, but if you've delegated service administrator access to any other accounts, you'll want to be sure to secure those as well. So at least enable multi-factor authentication for them. Um, and, and if you can implement some of the same sorts of measures that you use for the account administrator for those service administrator accounts, that's probably a good idea as well. So Azure also provides you with role-based access control and it's a, definitely a very good idea to make use of that and we want to use that according to the principle of least privilege. Um, so there are a bunch of standard roles that Azure provides you, um, but in addition to those, you can also create your own custom roles. Um, unfortunately, you need to use PowerShell or the CLI or the API to do that, but you can create roles um, that are bespoke and that have exactly the, the rights and permissions that you need them to use. And really that's, that's what we want to do in this in situation. We want to make sure that all of our users have access to do only the things that they really need to do. Um, but sometimes it can be quite difficult to know exactly what access any, any user or any service principal might need. And what that often leads to is um, people just granting those accounts with the owner access permission because that just makes things easier again. Um, but really the best practice is to avoid that if we possibly can. Um, unless, of course, that person really does need access to absolutely everything that that owner role gives them access to. Uh, so there are a couple of things we can do to help us identify the requirements for what access a user or a service principal needs. Probably the most obvious one is to leverage your Azure audit logs and see exactly which actions that those users or those service principals are, are performing on various resources and then use that as a basis to create your custom roles. Um, also, don't forget about the fact that there is metadata present inside your VMs. Um, now, Azure recently introduced a metadata service, so just like some of the other cloud providers, in fact, almost all of the other cloud providers, uh, you can now get some information through HTTP by um, you know, using curl or something inside each VM. Now, at the moment in Azure, there's quite limited information that you can get through that uh, NVM metadata service, but it's likely that Microsoft will be making changes to that in the future and that there's going to be additional metadata that will be made available. Uh, there are also some XML config files present on the VMs, and if it's Windows VM, that's in the C Windows Azure slash config directory. And inside those XML files, there's 
quite a lot of interesting metadata, but those uh, those files are restricted via NTFS permissions to the system and administrator accounts only. But it's also, it's still important to be aware of the fact that these things are there and the information that's in them and make sure that if somebody has a login to the VM or if somebody manages to get the ability to uh, run a command on the VM, just be aware of the sorts of information that they might be able to obtain from metadata. Now, if you've created service principles to use for your applications, um, just also be aware of how, of how you're securing and how you're using the uh, secret access keys or the certificates that you've created for those, um, as well as any storage account keys that you're using. So ideally, all of these sorts of things should be regularly rotated and, and you should keep them safe. So one very popular error to make is to publish those into code repositories. We definitely want to avoid that where possible. Um, so make sure that you've got a nice um, secure practice built to make sure that those keys, certificates, and, and those sorts of things are kept as secure as possible. Now, Microsoft uh, very helpfully provide us with Azure Active Directory, and we can use this to our advantage quite significantly. So the first thing to do with this is to define some sensible password policies, um, both in terms of the desired complexity of the password, the minimum length, and the maximum password age. Um, and if possible, you know, we really want to use multi-factor authentication for any users that are logging into the Azure portal. And um, that's unfortunately only available for sort of administrative accounts or, or service administrator accounts by default. But if you have Azure AD Premium, uh, that multi-factor auth functionality is then extended out to all users. Um, so it's not a one-time activity. We don't just want to set this thing up and then forget it. Um, ideally, we want to just keep monitoring that, um, making sure that it hasn't been changed, and making sure that any updates to best practices are being taken into account there. Now, I mentioned Azure AD Premium a little bit earlier, and that provides some really good additional security features beyond the MFA for all user accounts. Um, so as an example of one of them, uh, if you are an AAD Premium customer, Microsoft do provide some degree of security analytics and alerting on your Azure Active Directory Premium activity. So for example, um, it will alert if users log in from different geographic locations um, in an impossible period of time. So if I were to log into my account from here in the UK um, at, at sort of two o'clock in the afternoon, and then someone was to log into my account from New York at three o'clock in the afternoon, Microsoft would, would flag that as a, an anomaly because of course it's not possible for me to, um, to travel between those two positions in that period of time. So there's some uh, really good extra services that they provide with that feature. Now it's definitely a good idea to have as much visibility of and an understanding of what's in your environment as possible. There's an old saying in security that you can't secure what you can't see. And so of course, if, if you don't know that something's there, then you can't go and apply any security to it. And this is actually where the cloud has some quite significant benefits over an on-prem infrastructure. Um, in an on-prem environment, it, at any given point in time, it can be really quite difficult to know exactly what we've got connected to the network. Um, you've got people bringing in wireless devices, and of course doing an audit of what's in the data center is not a, a particularly easy activity. Uh, but in the cloud, we hopefully have a whole bunch of APIs that we can leverage to get an authoritative view of everything that we've got running in the environment and at any given time. Um, so it's really important to leverage that and get good visibility into what you have and, and where everything is. Uh, so where is quite an interesting concept. Where, you know, where are the users supposed to be deploying resources to? Um, you know, you want to know that if somebody spun up a, a new virtual machine or they've spun up resources in a new region, um, you'll want to know that they've actually done that uh, so that you can be sure that you know, they're applying the correct security to whatever it is that they're using. Um, you, know, you don't want to sort of get into a situation where you think everything's been deployed in the UK only to find out that somebody's actually been going off and deploying a bunch of resources in the US if you have a, a policy that uh, those region, regions shouldn't be used. 
Um, also, as Microsoft helpfully like to you know, release new services on a fairly regular basis, uh, you want to make sure that you know when people are using any new services that they happen to make available. Um, because if you haven't re reviewed one of these services and you've not defined you know, your best practice around uh, configurations for that service, um, you want to avoid the blind spot where you know, somebody is going off and using something that you're just completely unaware of. So um, if somebody is going to be using something, you want to make sure that you know what that is, um, you've determined a, the correct way to secure that, and that whoever spun that up has, has done it according to you know, your best practices. We also want to understand which resources have been made publicly accessible and how we're restricting, at least from a networking standpoint, the ports that are available over the internet. Uh, so generally speaking, if something doesn't need to be on the internet, then it probably shouldn't be on the internet. Uh, and Azure offers you things like VPN functionality, so it's a very good idea to take advantage of that where appropriate, especially for things like you know, admin access to virtual machines. So there's not really a good reason for anybody to be um, opening up SSH and RDP over the internet to their virtual machines. Um, ideally, if anybody does need that degree of access from anywhere, they should be coming in over a VPN to start with. And uh, finally, the Azure audit logs are, again, an ideal resource for you to use to identify any sort of new activity that's, that's been going on in the platform. So you can use that to identify uh, new resource groups that might have been created, uh, new VNets, um, new regions, and the use of new services. So where you are making use of you know, the many services that are available to you in Azure, you of course want to make sure that you're using those services in a secure manner. Um, so firstly, if you're using Azure SQL, which is you know, really quite a, a compelling service that Microsoft offers as, as a database as a service, um, you want to be aware that, at least for the time being, that, um, that the endpoints to Azure SQL are only accessible um, sort of over a public network. So for now, Azure haven't released the ability to put the Azure SQL endpoint inside your VNet. Um, which means that your access between your VMs and the Azure SQL instance is going to be over a public network, albeit still within the Azure platform. Um, so you need to make sure that you're configuring the database firewall um, appropriately so that only the VMs uh, inside your subscription that need that database access have um, permission to access it. Uh, there is a setting that is there when you create an Azure SQL instance, which allows access from all of the Azure platform. Um, and you probably don't want to leave that in place. I mean, granted, it, it's not the whole internet that's being opened up, but you are, um, if you leave that default setting on, you are opening up your access to anybody else who's actually using Azure. Um, so it's likely that Microsoft, as I said, will um, eventually release the functionality to put an endpoint for Azure SQL inside your VNet. And when they do make that feature available, it would definitely be a good idea to, to take that up and to make sure that you've implemented that. Uh, with regard to storage containers and the access policy for storage containers, um, ideally you probably want to always use a private access policy. Um, it can be quite tempting to use uh, the, the blob or the container policies where you know, when you create the container, um, where all of the assets that you're going to put in there are, are going to be public and they're going to be linked to from websites. Um, but really, it's better if you can use shared access signatures so that users are doing authenticated reads instead of just getting that, um, that public read access into those containers. And the reason for that is that you know, while the access policy might have been correct when you started, I mean, it's something that tends to be sort of set and then forgotten about. And when we did create the container, uh, yes, maybe all the blobs that, that were in there were supposed to be publicly accessible, but we can never sort of discount the fact that somebody might come along later on and, and put some non-public blobs into it. And so if we get into the practice of using a private access policy to start with, we'll avoid the situation where you know, somebody's gone and, and put the wrong content in the wrong container later on. Now, you'll definitely be uh, using network security groups inside your VNets. Um, and we've had a look at uh, how these are set up. and. 
there's some interesting sort of nuances to the way that they work. So uh, there are sort of two ways that you can assign a, a network security group. You can assign it either to a subnet or you can assign it to a virtual machine. Now, if you assign it at the subnet, um, it's interesting to note that it doesn't apply at the subnet perimeter. It actually applies individually to all the virtual machines that are in the subnet. Um, and the other thing that we found was interesting was that if you apply a network security group to a subnet and you have another network security group applying to a VM inside that subnet, then the, the rules in the two security groups um, are effectively anded together. So for example, if you wanted to open up uh, web access to a virtual machine, you'd need to allow that access both in the NSG that applies to the VM itself as well as the NSG that applies to the subnet. Um, so what we've found is uh, probably a simpler approach is to use subnet bound network security groups where all the virtual machines in the subnet definitely need the same access. Um, and then where you have uh, differing degrees of access required, um, maybe to create a new subnet, but don't apply a subnet NSG and apply individual VM NSGs to all the VMs inside that subnet. Um, of course, this again is something that you'll want to audit regularly um, because you definitely want to make sure that NSGs do apply in one way or another to every VM that you have there. You don't want any VMs to be left without a network security group applying to them. Um, and as you can be so granular with these things, um, you should make sure that you're only allowing the required IP addresses and ports in them. And you want to do that both in the inbound direction and in the outbound direction. Um, so because we can be so granular, it's, it's a good idea just to, to take that up um, and make sure that each VM has, has only the required access both in and out. So for the virtual machines themselves, um, it's quite important, of course, to regularly scan those for vulnerabilities because, of course, there are new vulnerabilities being identified all the time, almost on a daily basis sometimes. Um, and for all the new vulnerabilities that are discovered that, that do affect your VMs, you need to be aware of, of what they are and, and how they might impact your environment. Um, so one of the things that's a little bit different in the cloud is that we need to make sure that we're scanning in some sort of a way that understands the nature of a cloud environment. Uh, most of your traditional vulnerability scanners will rely on IP addresses, but if you have a cloud environment which is really dynamic, uh, you might find that you know if you scan a particular IP address uh, on any given day, that by the time five or ten days has elapsed, that the VM that was running on that IP address is gone, and you've now got a different virtual machine using the same IP address. So ideally, when we're scanning, we want to understand some of the metadata associated with the virtual machines so that when we come to review the scan results, um, we can actually tie the scan result back to uh, either a virtual machine itself or a virtual machine role. So if you're using images to deploy your virtual machines, um, maybe in that case, you probably don't want to remediate the virtual machines themselves off the back of a vulnerability scan, but instead you'll want to uh, patch your image instead. So deploy the image out to a new virtual machine, apply the patch to that, and then recapture the image. Um, so that way, any new machines that you deploy from the image will be automatically protected against that vulnerability. Um, and if you do the, the reverse approach, if you just patch the running VMs and don't update the image, of course, any time you deploy a new VM for any reason, that vulnerability will still be there. Now, of course, whether or not you do this, sort of depends on, on the method that you're using um, to deploy things into Azure. Um, so if you've sort of done a, a lift and shift migration from an on-prem deployment, um, you might find that, you know, that the environment in Azure isn't very dynamic and that to deploy a virtual machine from an image is going to be a lot of work for you. So if you're running that sort of a model, then you'll probably just want to go ahead and patch the virtual machines themselves. Um, but if you've adopted sort of a, a cloud-first approach to your deployment in Azure, um, where you, you know, have uh, con continuous integration and continuous deployment running, then patching the images will, will certainly be the way to go because you can just redeploy the application um, as soon as those patches have been applied. It's also a good idea to build a set of trusted images that your users can deploy from. Um, and 
using templates in Azure Resource Manager can be quite a good way to do that. Um, so you can make sure that the correct images are being used by your templates um, rather than using old images or default images. So next, it's uh, important to, of course, get visibility, visibility into your log data. So we want to make sure that we're capturing logs from both the operating systems and the applications themselves in near real time, and, and that's especially important if you're got a really if you've got a really dynamic environment. So if you're using auto scaling or you're frequently adding or removing virtual machines from the environment, um, having that collection in real time becomes very important because, of course. Once a virtual machine is deleted for any particular reason, all the logs that were on that that haven't been collected uh, have also been deleted with it. Um, so again, just like it is with patching, it's important again to um, gather the logs along with um, virtual machine metadata, um, and it's for the same principle. If if a, you know a, a virtual machine is uh, is deleted. Um, the logs really need to refer to something other than maybe the VM name or the IP address. We really want to know, you know, some more detail about what that virtual machine was at the point that it existed. So we need some metadata um, along with the logs to help us identify what that virtual machine was. Now there's certainly a decent amount of default logging going on inside the virtual machines, but um, you will probably also want to enable some additional logging where that's required. So one of the things that typically isn't enabled by default is, is audit logging. And if you were ever needing to undergo a forensic investigation, those audit logs um, you know, uh, can be you know, exceptionally powerful um, for those purposes. Um, so one really good example of this is PowerShell. PowerShell, of course, is you know, a, a very, very um, powerful tool. And by default, it, it really doesn't write any logs other than to say that somebody's launched it. Um, so there's been some very good improvements in PowerShell version 5, which uh, ships with Windows Server 2016 and is available as an upgrade uh, with the Windows, Windows Management Framework version 5 for any earlier versions. Um, so with that new version of PowerShell, you get some audit policies that you can turn on uh, in group policy that cause it to write a, a decent amount of audit data into the logs. So it's a really good idea to turn those on and to make sure you're capturing those PowerShell logs so you can see what someone's doing uh, when they're running PowerShell scripts on the servers. Um, finally, we, we couldn't uh, forget about the Azure audit logs again. So there's a wealth of information in those things, um, as well as the logs from any of the PaaS services that you might be using. So for log collection in an Azure environment, it's really important that we're collecting uh, logs from those as well. Now finally, it's of course also important to get visibility into the networks and applications. As Ollie was saying at the beginning, uh, attacks of course happen at every layer of the application stack. So just as it is in an on-prem environment, um, we want to implement some degree of network intrusion detection into our Azure environment. And ideally, uh, an intrusion detection solution in Azure should, should analyze rather all of the traffic between all of your virtual machines rather than just at the edge or the perimeter of the virtual network. Um, if you do only um, deploy IDS at the perimeter, you, you very significantly limit your visibility into what's going on because you end up being blind to all of the traffic that goes between the virtual machines themselves. Um, so for the most effective detection we can get, we, we really want to have visibility of that north-south traffic as well as uh, the analysis of, of east-west traffic between virtual machines. And of course, as application attacks are more prevalent in the cloud, um, it's very important also to have web application firewall capability. And things like the Azure Security Center will direct you uh, to deploy a web application firewall. Um, we really want you know, inspection and detection at, at layer 7 um, to identify application-specific attacks. And uh, when you do that, ideally, you want to leverage both a positive and a negative deploy, uh, enforcement model. Uh, so a negative enforcement model being where we can detect uh, traffic that we know is bad. So we know what SQL injection looks like. We know what cross-site scripting looks like. We can identify that activity and raise the alarm if we see it. Uh, but we also ideally want a positive security model, which is where we profile what the application looks like and, and what normal behavior looks like for the application. Um, 
So for an example, if you have a, a form field which normally contains an email address, the web application firewall should be looking to make sure that the input into that field is always in the format of an email address. And if somebody tries to put something else in there, then we can raise the alarm off the back of that as well. So sort of just to sum up all the things that we've been talking about so far, there are really sort of three buckets that we can put them into. So we want to make sure that we're um, configuring the platform according to security best practice, so that we're um, making sure that all, all the accounts are locked down and people only have access to what they need and all the network configuration is correct. Uh, we want uh, continuous visibility into what's going on, so we want to um, be scanning for vulnerabilities and for configuration issues, and we want to be collecting and storing the logs. And then finally, we need you know, security and compliance monitoring. So we want uh, monitoring, alerting, and remediation for, for network threats, um, for suspicious activity that we see in the log data, as well as any anomalous activity we might see with a web application firewall. And all of that, of course, should be underpinned by um, continuous threat intelligence and security operations and security updates. Okay, so I'll hand back to Ollie now, and he'll take you through a little bit about how Alert Logic can help you uh, with your security in Azure. Thanks, Paul. Um, some great information there, but I, I think to kind of reiterate it, and uh, again, as, as Paul mentioned, really the principles of security don't change uh, in the cloud, but your approach to security definitely needs to change. And we sort of explained a lot of that throughout, really. It's about the, the, the fact that the solution is always changing. People can make lots of configuration changes that we may not be aware of unless we're really keeping an eye on it and continually monitoring these, solu monitoring these solutions. So yes, absolutely look at how you can uh, approach moving to the cloud as quickly as possible in the most secure way by using security centers or make those help you make those decisions but ultimately it's ongoing best practices um, to make sure that you're continually monitoring and you understand your responsibility in the cloud and how you secure your cloud workloads so how does um, alert logic help you well um, I thought I'd bring up a quick slide to explain our capability here really we have the ability to do all of the kind of bits that, that, that Paul kind of mentioned in relation to kind of monitoring, ongoing monitoring of infrastructure, looking at the network, trying to detect whether there's threats there. And we've got 24 by 7 experts that know what to look for in the logs. They know what to look for in the network. And they're really monitoring it with expertise and intelligence uh, that we gather through 4,000 uh, clients that we're working with and their data set enables us to be better at detecting threats for organizations. We also have a response time of 15 minutes. So we're looking at those incidents and we're getting back to you as quickly as possible um, with an initial, here's what the real challenge is, here's what the threat is, and we give you some remediation advice. So you can go and respond to it with actionable security intelligence. So near real time, uh, incident uh, identification, and then prioritization so you can really get to the remediation actions. Covering obviously the network, the log data we talked about, being able to do vulnerability management to figure out where the vulnerabilities are, and then of course securing that layer seven application stack. So continuous threat research, advanced analytics, and a 24 by seven on top of that with alerting. So really covering all those major bits that you need to be monitoring for in your Azure platform. And so really that comes towards the end. We're going to answer a couple of questions here. Uh, resources, we've been submitting attachments and links all the way throughout to give you additional intelligence on what the capability is here. Um, if you do need any additional information, there's plenty of resources out there that we can give you access to. Um, we're going to have a quick look at a couple of questions. Uh, we've got a bit of time for those last few questions. Uh, if you have any others, feel free to submit them and we'll get through to those. Um, here's how you can keep connected with us, but let's just, uh, I'm going to quickly take a look at a couple of these questions here and submit them through um, so uh, I, one of the questions we've got here Paul maybe you can help answer this one can I move existing solutions to Azure I, I guess this kind of means kind of non-native kind of deployments you know if you've got a firewall or something or you've got some other security tooling moving that into Azure how does that work how easy is it to do something like that uh, so I guess as with many questions like this the, the short answer is it depends um, in terms of what you've been used to in a data center environment in terms of physical security appliances, things like firewalls, load balances, and things like that, they do differ slightly when you get into Azure. Um, you will find that there are some, other, some vendors in Azure that are 
providing things like firewall appliances and, and load balancer appliances that you can use if you want to. Um, but really that, that kind of for me goes against the grain of one of the benefits of cloud is that you've got this really big, really dynamic, really scalable environment. Um, because Microsoft provides you with uh, things like network security groups and, and load balancers, um, it's better to use those features rather than try to direct everything through a virtual appliance. Um, because what you'll find is that you know, if, if everything has to go through this, this one VM on its way into your environment, you, you've effectively got yourself a, a single point of failure or a bottleneck. Um, so using the cloud native features like network security groups, like the load balancers, um, can mean that your application can scale as much as you like um, and you're not constrained by sort of a more traditional uh, networking model. Uh, but from the application perspective itself, um, I, I'm sure there are plenty of examples out there of people who have you know, taken an existing on-premises application and basically imaged it and then redeployed it into Azure without any modifications. And uh, as long as you take into account some of the, the nuances of the platforms, so that things like the, um, uh, the VM scale sets and the VM availability sets, as long as you take those things into account and are aware that you know, the VMs uh, on an individual basis can go down from time to time as Microsoft patch the hypervisors underneath. Um, you can essentially take a, a traditional application and a traditional deployment model and lift and shift it into Azure as just taking those few things into account. Um, but once you do have it there, obviously it is a good idea at some point to um, start thinking about how to make that more cloud native and, and how to get away from that um, model of treating your servers as, as pets um, and how to get more towards the model of, of treating them as cattle where they're, they're more disposable and, uh, and the environment's more dynamic. Yeah, so I guess the risks there, Paul, isn't it, that if, if somebody has a non-native solution and they take it down, if it's like a lift and shift, then the challenges are that you might lose state. As databases are running with state, you could end up taking down critical data. And I guess the other big challenge for a traditional security tooling especially is that it just doesn't know when the system's up or down, and then it gets a bit confused with the fact that systems are offline permanently because they never know that these machines are never going to come back. Um, another question in here, which is, 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 is essentially saying how Alert Logic can help SaaS model. Um, I, I'm not really sure, I guess, but maybe we can cover, you know, what this question is asking. But I guess, guess we can cover, you know, the differences between PaaS uh, and, and of course, infrastructure as a service and the kind of challenges around those two. Sure. Yeah. So I think most of what we've been talking about today is, is talking about infrastructure as a service, which is you know, where we take basically virtual machines and we start splitting them up in Azure and then you know, run them in a, a model that we're pretty much familiar with in, in terms of um, virtualization. If we move up the stack a little bit more, we, we pass off more responsibility to Microsoft to run some of the application infrastructure. So when we look at platform as a service, um, so things like Azure SQL or Azure Web Services, you know, Microsoft are running the SQL Server instance for us, or the SQL Server cluster, or however they're doing it, and just providing us basically with a, a database instance inside there. Um, so we get a little bit, we sacrifice some control and we sacrifice some access, but we, you know, at the same time we, we trust Microsoft to run that well and to secure that well, and as a result we get a nice dynamic and scalable database at, at a lower cost. And, and it's a similar scenario with Azure Web Services where Microsoft are run, uh, looking after the, the Windows operating system and the IIS layer, and we're just getting essentially a website inside IIS, and we've got the, all of the underlying components managed by Microsoft. But when we're talking about software as a service, we're, we're really relinquishing everything out to the service provider. So the, the most common example of software as a service, at least in the Microsoft world, is Office 365. Um, and as you sort of relinquish more and more control over to the service provider, there's really less that you're responsible for in terms of security. So if we remember back to that uh, shared security responsibility slide that we saw at the beginning, um, the, the more control you hand over to the service provider, the less that's in scope um, for you as the customers to protect. And in a software as a service model, really pretty much all elements of it uh, are down to the service provider apart from how you configure that service yourself. So in the case of Office 365, the users you create in there and, and what access those users have. Um, so at the moment, uh, support for Office 365 specifically is on our roadmap. Um, we don't have uh, any capability to secure Office 365 itself 
uh, right now, but we're certainly looking at that. And the the only way we could really do it is through ingesting the logs that are that are generated by that service, um, and pulling those into our back end, applying security analytics to them, um, and presenting those back to you as um, security incidents with remediation advice. But um, really, the secure software as a service, uh, unless you're unless you're delivering software as a service by running a whole bunch of infrastructure as a service, th there's currently probably very little we can do, unfortunately. Yeah, so it's absolutely, it's about getting visibility in those cases, isn't it? Because you're kind of relinquishing some of the visibility that you'd normally get if you were running these services yourself. Uh, and, and, I, and I guess with that, we're unfortunately run out of time. So if, if you didn't feel like all your questions were answered and you wanted to submit those through, don't forget, obviously, there's plenty of ways in which to get in contact with AlertLogic and submit an email to an, your account manager if you're already familiar with somebody or reach out to us through some of our channels here. Thank you very much for joining. Um, we appreciate uh, your feedback as well. So feel free to feedback any information uh, that you feel is useful. And uh, thanks very much for joining us and see you on the next webinar. Thanks very much.